There are things we don't often remember. There are books maybe that we read more often than others. And probably the, the books of the prophets, both major and minor, uh, among the books of the Old Testament. They would probably be among those that don't first come to our mind. Well, I'm going to read something today. Uh, let me read the book of Obadiah. Uh, it doesn't come quickly or first to, to my mind. And whether it does yours or not, you can decide. But partly understandably so, because would you rather read a story or would you rather read a speech? I think for, for most of us, we, are, we would be more quickly drawn to, to the stories. And so God records stories. But God also records uh, these, these speeches, these messages that were given in, in a different form. And to study those takes a, a different kind of interest and a, a different level of intensity in some way. As I found out in, in studying this book, when I uh, decided to prepare this lesson, I thought, well, it's, it's just one chapter, so this should be a, a fairly short and, and simple uh, lesson to prepare. And it was a reminder that when you study one prophet, if you're going to understand it, you're probably going to have to study and consult at least one and maybe two or more other prophets, whether major or minor, in that. And so it, uh, the prophets, again, they challenge our will to study and our purpose to study. But as in all things, the, the more that we put into it, the more that we invest uh, as we read and as we then do the work, not just of reading, but reading for the purpose of understanding, we get some insight into the depth of the mind of God. And in the, the prophets, we get also some insight into how God views the nations because uh, the majority, if not all, of the prophets are written and addressed to nations. Uh, so we think about you know, the book of Philemon. Well, that's written to an individual. And in the New Testament, many of those books are written to churches. But the prophets are written on a little bit of a broader scale, uh, are written to nations, giving us some idea of how God views every nation. And while certainly some of the laws that God has given have changed, the way that God views nations uh, in general has not. Uh, during Dad's time with us, we looked at some lessons. He taught us about some, uh, the direction of some segments, some parts of our society. And so today I wanted to look at, at one of the prophets at the book of Obadiah uh, to give us a view of, of another nation. So in some ways, during the, the past lessons, we were thinking about some parts of our nation. Well, today I want to look at a different nation, and that is the nation of Edom. That is, that is who Obadiah mostly writes about. Edom, the ancient country, uh, was south. Here's the Dead Sea, the Sea of Galilee. And so you have half of this area is Jordan and the other is Israel. And Edom composed that latter area where you have the blue marker here. That's where this next picture is taken from. Here's some area where they have been able to go and find and identify uh, the, the area where the people of Edom lived. One thing I want you to notice, you can see in the background, you can see the elevation uh, of this area where the people of Edom lived, and that's going to play a part in what we study. Here's a, a map that goes more to the, uh, the boundaries and the places of the people of the past. So you see at the bottom the kingdom of Edom, and then you see at the bottom the place Petra. The next picture is from, from that area. And likewise, it gives, gives this sense of where they lived. They, they were uh, people of the mountains. We'll see Mount Seir was one of the areas uh, where, uh, that, that represented this entire area. And so part of Obadiah's message to them, these who lived in the mountains, these who lived in the heights, which of course is always a, a place of strength and of strategic uh, strength. Uh, this is where they lived, but what God tells to the Edomites through the prophet Obadiah is that though you live high, I will bring you down. And so this gives us uh, God's view of this nation. Just a general outline, my charts will not have great detail, but what we're going to look at, the first 16 verses, show us that punishment is coming to Edom. God makes the promise to punish them. So read with me beginning in verse 1. The vision of, Ob the vision of Obadiah, thus says the Lord God concerning Edom, 
We have heard a report from the Lord, and a message has been sent among the nations, saying, Arise, and let us rise up against her for battle. Uh, Obadiah, we, we don't really know much about him. He's, there are others named Obadiah in the Old Testament, but it's unlikely that any of those Obadiahs are this Obadiah. He also doesn't, unlike most other prophets, he doesn't give at the beginning, uh, the word of the Lord came to me during the reign of King so-and-so of Judah or of Israel. And so there are not, there, there's few, if any, very specific markers that give us the time or the place uh, of his work, uh, other than he's, he's writing, uh, of course, to Edom. But we, we do know a little bit more about Edom. The Lord is writing, or Obadiah is speaking, concerning Edom. What do we know about Edom? Well, you would know Edom maybe more by their founder Esau. Esau. Edom was the descendants of Esau. Esau being the son of Isaac. Esau being the, the twin, Jacob and Esau. And so when, because of the disputes in the home between Jacob and Esau, when Esau left his home, he went off and he married, and he married several women uh, of other, other families and of na other nations. We read that he goes to Mount Seir, S-E-I-R, and that's where his family grows and becomes a nation, and that was a part of the promise uh, that God gave to him. Thinking about the Edom Edomites and their relationship to Israel, it's kind of like uh, the relationship between the U.S. and, and England. You, you can't look at American history without bumping into England, of course. That, that's just an inseparable part of who we are. Well, for the people of Edom, because of Esau's relationship to Israel, to Jacob, Edom also, whether they studied history in, in their education, I don't know, but whenever you had the story of Edom, you automatically have the story of Isaac and of Jacob, of Israel. Exactly what, what parts of that were preserved and passed down, I, I don't know. But uh, it becomes pretty clear from Obadiah's writings and from others that some parts of, if not all of, the story of the birthright, of the supplanter, Jacob, of maybe the story of the stew, you remember that? And then Jacob deceiving his father in order to take the birthright. Uh, some, some parts of that were definitely preserved among the people of Edom, and that soured their relationship not just between Jacob and Esau, not just between Israel and Esau, but then later, even far, far hundreds of years into the future, it soured the relationship between the nation of Israel and the nation of Edom. And that bitterness is reflected in, in what we're going to read but if you were to get a concordance and look up all the passages where Edom is mentioned, uh, they, as Israel encounters them as they leave Egypt and are heading towards the Promised Land in the book of Numbers chapter 20 and verse 21, they come to the Edomites. And then David, when he is king in 2 Samuel 8 and verse 14, uh, he has some interaction with them. And every time you do, uh, what is always in the background between Edom and Israel is that history of Jacob and Esau. And so God here is going to, Obadiah says, God is stirring up enemies against, uh, against the people of Edom. Go back to Joel, Joel chapter 3, and for sake of reference, you've got Joel, Amos, and Obadiah together. And I don't know that I had noticed this before, but uh, these, these definitely are all connected because each of them talk in varying degrees about Edom. So Joel is two, back, two books back from Obadiah. Joel chapter 3 and verse 19. Notice Edom is, is included here. Egypt shall be a desolation, and Edom a desolate wilderness, because of violence against the people of Judah, for they have shed innocent blood in their land. Also, Amos speaks of Edom. Amos chapter 9 and verse 12. So Joel, Amos, Amos chapter 9, verse 12, and then that gets you back to, to Obadiah in just a moment. Amos 9, 12 says that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord 
who does this thing. Also, the book of Ezekiel, I won't turn and read from that, but Ezekiel chapter 35, Ezekiel speaks directly about Edom as Obadiah was, uh, does. And then also in Jeremiah chapter 49, I won't turn and read that text, but we're going to read uh, the, the same words in the book of Obadiah that Jeremiah spoke concerning Edom. In Jeremiah 14 through 16, if you were to read that, then as we read in just a moment, verses 2 through 4, Jeremiah writes exactly the same message from God about the people of Edom. So, the point is that, that Obadiah is not the only one who writes concerning them. And I, I don't know the exact order of Joel, Amos, and Obadiah, and who said, who said what first, but, but much was said about them and these, these warnings that are given. So now go back to Obadiah, chap, uh, Obadiah verse 2. So verse 1 tells us this message has been sent. Some are being risen up by God to go to battle against Edom. Behold, verse 2, I will make you small among the nations. You shall be greatly despised. And so whatever, whatever status Edom had at this time, it was going to be lessened. It was going to be diminished. And why, why, is, why is God picking on Edom? Well, verses 3 and 4, The pride of your heart has deceived you. You who dwell in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high, you who say in your heart, who will bring me down to the ground? Though you ascend as high as the eagle, and though you set your nest among the stars, from there I will bring you down, says the Lord. I should have mentioned earlier, uh, this which is carved into the rock, the Edomites did not do that. Uh, a later nation did but this is still the same place that they inhabited. And so Mount Seir was among the most prominent sites in Edom as they inhabited that land. And so they, they were confident because of where we are uh, that, that we, we are impenetrable. We're, uh, we cannot be defeated as long as, we, as long as the battle is on our own home turf. But here uh, God ironically says, I will bring you down. In verse 7, or excuse me, verses 5 and 6, If thieves had come to you, if robbers by night, oh, how you will be cut off, would they not have stolen till they had enough? If grape gatherers had come to you, would they not have left some gleanings? Oh, how Esau shall be searched out, how his hidden treasures shall be sought after. And so here, Obadiah's building the anticipation of the destruction. He says if it was just a common enemy, if it was just a, a common robber, he, would, he could only carry out as much as he, he would have. But those, he says, who I am sending to you, they're going to take all that you have. All that you have. And in verse 6, Esau, remember, is Edom, just like sometimes Israel as a nation, sometimes is called Jacob. Uh, the same connection is being here. And so even your hidden treasures... They're going to look for everything that they can find. That's the destruction that is coming. Verses 8 and 9, they not only were proud of their, uh, their global position, but also they were proud of, of the people among them. Verse, uh, verse set, verses 7 through 9, All the men in your confederacy shall force you to the border. The men at peace with you shall deceive you and prevail against you. Those who eat your bread shall lay a trap for you, the, those that they trade with. No one is aware of it. Will I not in that day, says the Lord, even destroy the wise from Edom and understanding from the mountains of Esau? Then your mighty men, O Teman, shall be dis dismayed to the end that everyone from the mountains of Esau may be cut off by slaughter. So there was going to be a, a surprise attack and they were going to be attacked by their friends, those they traded with, uh, those they had treaties with. And everyone is going to be cut off. Uh, though you are high, I will bring you down. Though you are wise, though you have the wise among you, uh, you, you don't see what's coming, he says. No one is aware of it. And though you have your mighty men, uh, they're all going to be cut off There's in this slaughter that I will send. So verses 1-9 through nine describe... Uh, the reason or the, the punishment that is coming. Uh, next, verses 10 through 14 describe 
why God is, is punishing them. Read with me verses 10 through 14. For violence against your brother Jacob, shame shall cover you. Now remember, this is hundreds of years after uh, the conflict between Jacob and Esau. So he's still speaking of the nations. And you shall be cut off forever in the day that you stood on the other side. And the day that strangers carried captive his forces, that's the people of Israel, when foreigners entered his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem, even you were as one of them among the enemies. But you should not have gazed on the day of your brother in the day of his captivity, nor should you have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction." nor should you have spoken proudly in the day of distress. You should not have entered the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Indeed, you should not have gazed on their affliction in the day of their calamity, nor laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity. You should not have stood at the crossroads to cut off those among them who escaped, nor should you have delivered up those among them who remained in the day of distress." So if we were trying to, to, to mark uh, the, the date, or if we were to find with trying to put a timeline within Scripture, well, when, when was Obadiah writing? This is as close to a detail as we get. There was some time where Israel and Judah was attacked, where they were taken captive, and where Jews, Jerusalem was even entered by the enemy, and they were either in cooperation with that enemy, or uh, they maybe came after the fact, and followed up with some attacks, and it's mentioned that even some who escaped, they found them and they, and they cut them off. So exactly what attack he's talking about, it, it doesn't specify who, you know, who that enemy was. If, if he did, we could nail it down a little bit more easily. Uh, there, there is an attack mentioned upon Judah and Jerusalem in Second Chronicles 21, 8-17, and the Philistines are mentioned there. And the Edomites are mentioned there, so that, that's one possibility. But, but usually when we read about the captivity of Israel, we think, well, that, that was the time when the Assyrians came and took Israel captive. And we, when we read about Judah being taken into captivity, uh, that's usually when Babylon came and took them. That's what the book of Daniel is about. Remember, Daniel's in Babylon with Nebuchadnezzar. And so that, that also could be the time uh, that, that Obadiah is writing of. And so it just depends on which captivity, which attack is being described. And Obadiah is just writing sometime after that one, uh, which, whichever it is. But this is, this is why they're being punished. Next, verses 15 and 16. He says, For the day of the Lord upon all the nations is near. As you have done, it shall be done to you. Your reprisal shall return upon your own head, for as you drank on my holy mountain, so shall all the nations drink continually. Yes, they shall drink and swallow, and they shall be as though they had never been. The day of the Lord, that's a, if you read, especially the minor prophets, uh, but included in the major as well, that, that's a common phrase. It's even found in the New Testament. The, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. So this is a phrase that, that always context has to define well, what, what day is it talking about. Uh, it, it's always a day of, of God coming, either bringing judgment uh, or bringing deliverance and salvation or, or sometimes both. He's going to come and destroy some and then He's going to come and save some. In verses 15 and 16, pretty clear, He's talking about a time of vengeance, a time of punishment is coming to the people of Edom. But notice he doesn't, in verse 15, now he doesn't only specify Edom. The day of the Lord is coming for who? He says, for all nations. That's right, for all nations. And here, I think because of the context, I don't believe he's talking about all the nations of the earth. But remember in verses 10 through 14, he's saying there were some who came to Israel and some who came and attacked Judah. And, and then you, were, you participated in, in that as well. So I, I think the day of the Lord being described here is all the nations who are involved antagonistically against my people, the people of Israel and the people of Judah. And if, if you went back to Joel chapter 3, uh, we'll, we'll do so in a little 
more in just a moment. Uh, other nations are, are specified uh, as, as we read about Egypt and, and also Edom. So here, the, the day of the Lord is coming in verse 16 that is, is in response to, that is punishment for uh, the, the attack upon Israel and upon Judah. But that punishment is not all that is, is happening. And that brings us to the final section, verses 17 through 21. Punishment is coming, but also deliverance is coming. And this is where we get a little bit out of, of the history. So if history is, is not your area of, of interest, well, then now Obadiah is going to look, look forward. And when we, when we come to the times where the prophets write about the past, but we can only know what they're talking about if we've got some record uh, of the people of, of Edom, or as, we were no, as I was mentioning, well, we don't know exactly what point in history Obadiah is talking about, so that makes it a little bit difficult. Well, likewise, when the prophets start talking about the future, that also can become difficult. We've got to find something within what the prophets are talking about that we do understand, because if you've read the prophets much, you realize you come to some, uh, some statement and you think, well, what, what, what is that talking about? Is that literal? Is that spiritual? Is this talking about an earthly kingdom or a future kingdom? And so you, you just use the, the common sense rule anytime you don't understand what someone was saying. Well, you, you ask. In other words, you review what was said. Or you find something in what they said that you did understand. And then sometimes you use that to over, unravel and to figure out what they were talking about. And so that, that's the basic rule that we use in language and that we use in studying the Bible. When you read the prophets and you come to some, uh, something, some statement or some paragraph that is a little bit hard to unravel, as I did in my study, what you do is you find something in that that you do understand and you start there. You start what you do, do know in that context or maybe in your study of the, the prophets, you might try to find another prophet who's talking about the same kingdom, who's talking about the same uh, prophecy, who's talking about the same subject, and then those other books provide some commentary. And so the, the best commentary in my study for Obadiah was the books of Joel and Amos. And so we'll lean on them as we continue through. In, in verse 21, the end of verse 21, it says, And the kingdom shall be the Lord's. And so as I worked through this, that, that was kind of my marker uh, of where, where I could start from. Obadiah is talking about the kingdom that shall be the Lord's. So if you're reading the prophets and you start reading about a kingdom, it might be the kingdom of Ammon or it might be the kingdom of, of Edom. But maybe you, you start thinking about some of the prophecies like the book of Daniel. Out of all the book of Daniel, his prophecy in Daniel chapter 2 of the statue they had the head of gold and the chest of silver and so on. You remember that one? And in Daniel chapter 2, verse 44, Daniel tells Nebuchadnezzar that in the days of these kings, do you remember what God was going to do? He was going to set up a, a kingdom. Set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. That, that, that helps to uh, clue us in some in the book of Obadiah. Obadiah is talking about a kingdom kingdom that will be the Lord's. Now, you have the kingdom of Israel, and that kingdom was the Lord's. And you have the kingdom of Judah, and that was the Lord's. And those were physical kingdoms. But Daniel's talking about a kingdom that will be set up. In the days of these kings, God will set up a kingdom. So that, that's clearly not a restored, rejuvenated, replanted Israel. Israel was bought, brought back from captivity for sure, but God was going to set up a kingdom. That gives us something to work with. And then, uh, again, trying to think of things we're familiar with to help us. What's, what's this deliverance you're talking about, Obadiah? What, what was one of the messages of John and of Jesus that overlapped? Do you remember anything that they were preaching and the wording really is recorded in exactly the same terms? Repent... For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. John preached that in, in Matthew chapter 2, or chapter 3, verse 1. Jesus is recorded as preaching that, especially early in His work. Matthew 4, verse 17. So which kingdom were they talking about? Were they talking about Israel? 
Well, no, Israel and, and Judah was already there. They were talking about that kingdom that, that Daniel was writing about. And they were living in the time frame that Daniel was talking about. That, that gives us something else to work with as we go back to the book of Obadiah. But a couple more things. Jesus, when he spoke to Pilate, you know, Pilate heard the accusations. Jesus is, is a competitor to Caesar. And what did Jesus say about his kingdom? In John 18, 36, in that private conversation with Pilate, he said something that, that helped Pilate to realize these Jews, I don't know what they're talking about, but this man is not guilty of what they're saying. Because Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. Pilate was a typical corrupt politician and governor, but he, he could see that. He could, could see Jesus well enough to know by what he saw and what he heard, Jesus is not uh, in, in competition with me or, or Caesar. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. Do you think that was the same kingdom that John was talking about and that Jesus was talking about? That, that's an easy connection to make. And so, Jesus' kingdom is not of this world. And in Colossians 1 verse 13, Paul says that God has delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. Not a future kingdom from the time of Paul, but He has translated, transferred, conveyed us. Think of a conveyor belt. It takes your, your bag from here to there at the airport. Well, He has conveyed us from the power of darkness into the kingdom of the Son of His love. So, maybe what you already remember and have studied, maybe other prophecies or passages about the kingdom, if we can have those in mind, now let's go back to the book of Obadiah and where there are some things that, that maybe not for you, but that were for me difficult to work through. We start with that. Uh, that Obadiah is writing about this kingdom that will be the Lord, something as he speaks and looks to the future. So now let's go back to verse 17. I jumped to the end of verse 21 to grab that, uh, that marking point. But back to verse 17. The first part of verse 17 but says, But on Mount Zion there shall be deliverance, and there shall be holiness. So here's another case. We've got to look. Okay, Mount Zion. Uh, what, what, what is that? Remember, Mount Zion would just be Jerusalem. Mount Zion is the place. Jerusalem is the place where God put His name. Uh, it was not just the capital of, of the, the nation of Israel. It was the place where the temple was. It was, the, it was God's dwelling place. If God had a home on earth, then it, it would have been Jerusalem. And so it, it was God's unique presence among His people. So after talking about punishment is coming, destruction is coming, a slaughter is coming, then He says, but at Mount Zion, there's not the slaughter and the destruction, there is deliverance. And, He says, there will be holiness. So, we, is he talking about a convention at the temple? What, what's he talking about? Is he talking about some physical activity? Or, again, because we jumped ahead to the kingdom, maybe this has some connection with the future. And this is where the commentary of the book of Joel will help. Go to Joel chapter 2. Joel 2, verse 32. Maybe a... a Verse familiar because it's cited in Acts chapter 2. Joel chapter 2 and verse 32. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be deliverance. As the Lord has said among the remnant, whom the Lord calls. So Joel also makes this connection of, uh, of deliverance coming from Jerusalem. And then also go back to the book of Isaiah. We'll, we'll quickly come back, back to Obadiah. But go to Isaiah chapter 2. Have you ever, ever studied that? Isaiah 2 alongside Daniel 2 alongside Joel 2. Uh, when I was young and... and uh, Studying and preparing to, to teach, that was one of the first lessons that, that I was taught 
the connection between Isaiah 2 and Daniel 2 and Joel 2. If you haven't studied those in connection with each other, we'll touch on them this morning, but that would be a good, uh, good study for you. Isaiah chapter 2, read with me verses 1 through 4. And that you'll, you'll immediately see the overlap. The word that Isaiah, the son of Amoz, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills. And all nations shall flow to it. Many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us His ways, and we shall walk in His paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge. Remember that, because we're going to read about judgment in a few minutes. He shall judge between the nations and rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. So, Joel talks about the, those who call upon the Lord shall be saved or delivered. And then Isaiah gives this phrase, in the latter days, in the last days, in the later times. And then he talks about Jerusalem and, and deliverance and Zion. So, keep those in mind as we go back then to Obadiah. 17. Again, on Mount Zion there shall be deliverance and there shall be holiness. God delivered Israel at different times, but physical deliverance just kept the nation afloat for a few more years. Their, their sin continued. There are very few periods of time where the majority of the Israelites uh, would have been described in their in their heart and their soul and their conduct as, as holy. But what Obadiah tells us here is that there's going to be holiness when there is deliverance. Well, what, when was there a time of deliverance and holiness at Jerusalem? And we might could think of the well, Ezra and Nehemiah. They came and rebuilt the temple. That, that's one occasion. But what about where Peter quotes exactly what we read in Joel chapter 2, in Acts chapter 2, in verses 17 through 21, uh, Peter quotes a longer section of the passage from Joel, Joel 2, 32, that we read a moment ago. And then in Acts chapter 3 and verse 24, so just probably a few days later, Peter's still in Jerusalem. Acts 3.24, he says, Yes, and all the prophets, all the prophets from Samuel Lost my place. All the prophets from Samuel and those who follow, as many as have spoken, have also foretold these days. Remember Isaiah said the last days or the latter days. And talked about deliverance from Zion. And now, now Peter says, what I've been saying and what you've been seeing and, and hearing, this is what all of the prophets, all of the prophets pointed to this. And then one other example in Acts chapter 28. So at the end of the book of Acts, Peter, he's saying exactly the same thing when he was under house arrest. And some of the Jews came to him. They appointed him a day. Many came to him at his lodging, to whom he explained and solemnly testified of the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus from both the law and the prophets, uh, excuse me, the law of Moses and the prophets from morning till evening. So there's something that all of the prophets were talking about connected to Joel, even back to Samuel in some ways, including uh, here Obadiah and, and Isaiah. So back, back to Obadiah. When, when God delivered Israel at different times, He was preserving a nation because of what promise? Because God was going to bring deliverance through Jesus Christ, and Jesus was going to come from a nation. So God often brought deliverance to Israel, but what was the purpose? 
to preserve a nation, to preserve a people for this deliverance that he was bringing. So I think Joel helped us to understand Obadiah as we read Joel 2.32. Now go back to Joel 3, verses 16 and 17. And I think Joel helped us to understand Obadiah. I think Obadiah helps us to understand Joel a little bit. Joel 3, 16 and 17, and you might even keep your passage in Obadiah open to be able to, to flip back and forth. Joel 3, 16, The Lord also will roar from Zion and utter His voice from Jerusalem. The heavens and earth will shake, but the Lord will be a shelter for His people and strength to the children of Israel. So you shall know that I am the Lord your God, dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. Then Jerusalem shall be holy and no alien shall ever pass through her again. Obadiah talked about holiness. And notice here that, that jo Joel says, there will be no alien. Now, when was there a time that Jerusalem was holy and there was no alien? There was no Gentile. There was no hypocrite. It was a holy city with no outsiders. I, I don't know that there was ever ever a time like that. But what Joel and Obadiah are talking about is there will be a time in Jerusalem exactly like that. Now, how about that kingdom we were speaking of earlier? He has transferred us from the power of darkness into the kingdom of the Son of His love. What about that kingdom? Are, are, are there any aliens there? Are there any outsiders is there anyone under the power of darkness, but they're in the kingdom of the sun? No, in the kingdom of the sun, there is holiness. There is no alien there. So, I think Joel and Obadiah work together and help us to see both. They're both looking to this time of which the prophets spoke. There will be this deliverance and there will be this holiness and then let's read verses 17 through 20. The house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. The house of Jacob shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame. But the house of Esau shall be stubble. They shall kindle them and devour them, and no survival shall remain of the house of Esau, for the Lord has spoken. The south shall possess the mountains of Esau, and the low land shall possess Philistia. And they shall possess the fields of Ephraim and the fields of Samaria. Benjamin shall possess Gilead. And the captives of this host of, this host of the children of Israel shall possess the land of the Canaanites. As far as Zarephath, the captives of Jerusalem who are in Sepharad shall possess the cities of the south. So there's deliverance that is coming. Who, who's going to be delivered and who will do the delivery? Who will bring that deliverance? Mark your Bible there. We're going to, to, to stop our study here. Um, I didn't plan well. This would have been better for a Sunday night lesson follow-up, but tonight it's the second Sunday. I didn't realize that until I was too far into this. So we'll just pick up here, Lord willing, next Sunday, uh, Sunday morning, and we'll complete here the the deliverance that is being offered you might review it uh, and again also compare some of, of the book of Joel and, and even some in Amos that overlaps so we'll pick up looking what what is the deliverance that is is being offered here who's going to save and who is going to be saved and so if you if you'll review this week verses 17 through 21 uh, that that may help us as we resume this study Lord willing next week Turn your songbooks though to number 310. We've already touched at the, the hint uh, that Obadiah has given of, of this deliverance and of this kingdom that is coming. And as we noted, noticed from the preaching of John and of Jesus and of Peter in Acts 2 and, and of Paul, uh, we're, we're looking ahead that the book of Obadiah is talking about the deliverance that we have, that, that God offers to us, and that we ought to be offering to others. That was a part of the purpose of our work uh, this this past week uh, but we have the work of 
of continuing that. And so as we sing this song, let's think about our own responsibility to continue the work of deliverance that Jesus brought when He came. As we sing this song, if, if we have that deliverance and that hope, then let's sing the song with the conviction that we will continue in that uh, day by day with whatever life God gives to us. If there are any, though, who are here and know that, you're, that you are in need of the deliverance that God has prom prophesied of, that God has promised, and that He has delivered through Jesus Christ, you've had a reminder of the invitation that Jesus offers. Uh, just a few minutes ago, when we ate the bread and drank the cup, we were reminded of His death and, and of the purpose of that. If In thinking on the, the death of Jesus Christ and of the resurrection of this day, uh, you know that you need to appeal to Him for that help and that forgiveness and that deliverance. If you would come with the mouth, with your mouth, confession is made into salvation. Would you confess that faith that Jesus is the Christ? And on that same day that Peter said, whoever calls on the name of the Lord, on that same, same day he said, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Now, that is the promise that Joel was pointing to. And that's the promise that God has made to those who would call upon Him, who would confess their faith and be baptized. If that's your need, we hope this song will, will prick your conscience and your heart. Or if as a Christian... you you need to return to Him and call on Him for this same deliverance again. If, if we can help you and encourage you in, in these ways or in any way, tell us how as we stand and sing. <clears throat>